Hello, and thank you for watching this talk. My name is Oliver Fulcox, and I'm a PhD candidate in Princeton University and a visitor at the Institute for Advanced Studies. In the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to be discussing some recent work I've been doing in collaboration with the people below me here, in particular, Zach Slepian and Jamin Ho down in Florida. And this all focuses around the broad idea of making measurements of the galaxy three and four point correlation functions and seeing what interesting cosmology we can do with them. So to kick off, let's start by thinking of the current state of cosmology using galaxy surveys. So within the last few years, we've reached the point now in which constraints from spectroscopic galaxy surveys on cosmological parameters, for example, the Hubble parameter, are now rivaling the sort of precision we can get from the cosmic microwave background. So to give you an example, these are some recent constraints on the Hubble parameter, the matter density and sigma eight from in red, Planck, versus in blue, the BOSS galaxy survey. And what you can see here is in particular for H naught, the sort of constraints we get from galaxy surveys, plus or minus one, are actually now very much comparable with those from Planck, plus, plus 1.3 minus 0 0.7 here. And these were derived completely independently of the CMB. Of course, in the next decade, we're gonna have a huge wealth of new surveys. For example, DESI, Euclid, Roman, and Rubin will all be coming online shortly. And all of these will help to strengthen our information about cosmological parameters. So the current way of doing cosmology from galaxy surveys all focuses around two-point statistics. So what do I mean by this? I mean one of two things, either the power spectrum or the two-point correlation function. So probably everyone is familiar with both of those statistics. So the power spectrum, this is what it looks like for, say, the BOSS galaxy survey. In red and blue here, I'm showing the power spectrum monopole and quadrupole, with the quadrupole showing the effects of redshift space distortions. And the yellow and light blue are showing here the effects of power spectrum reconstruction, which gives us a slightly more wiggly feel. So this is one way of parameterizing information locked up in the galaxy density field. Another way is to use the two-point correlation function of the galaxy density field. So this guy looks something more like this. This is another measurement from BOSS back a couple of years ago now. This really shows a similar, a similar thing. We can see kind of a broad feature of the correlation function and this little bump around 100 megaparsecs, which is a signature of the BEO, just like the wiggles in the power spectrum. So why are all analyses focused on this? Well, the answer is quite simple. If the universe obeys Gaussian statistics, by which I mean the density field is Gaussian, Gaussian random, then all of the possible information must be contained within the two-point function, either its power spectrum or its Fourier transform equivalent, this correlation function I'm showing here. So if we make that assumption of Gaussianity, it makes sense just to look at these statistics. However, at late times, the universe absolutely isn't Gaussian. As we know well, gravitational evolution transfers information from out of the two-point functions into higher order statistics, such as the three and four-point functions. And those are going to be what I'm going to talk about for the rest of this talk. So to start off with, let me define slightly more formally what I mean by these two, three, and four-point correlation functions. So it's probably all remember from introductory cosmology courses, the two-point function is defined as the excess probability of finding two galaxies separated by some distance r. You can also write it here as a convolution of two density fields. So delta here is the galaxy over density. What does this look like physically? Well, let's say we've got a galaxy survey like this one on the right from now two degree field, quite a number of years ago. Basically put two galaxies at different points. Say, what's the probability we find them separated by this distance r, which could be a vector. And as I said, if the universe is Gaussian, this contains all the relevant cosmological information. So stepping on to the three-point function, we can do a similar procedure. Now notice that we've gone from having two points in space to three points in space. So the three-point function simply parameterizes the probability that we find galaxies in a triplet separated by R1 and R2 vectors. And this is really relevant if the universe is non-Gaussian. Of course, we could go another step further. We could define a four-point function. Again, this is very simple. We add a fourth point into our galaxy survey here, and we simply say, what's the probability we observe these four galaxies in this particular tetrahedral shape. So here we're parameterizing it by three lengths, R1, and R2, and R3. In reality, the four-point function is a little bit more complicated because we're really interested in what's the probability we find it in the specific tetrahedron. And to do that, we actually have to remove the pieces which correspond to just two pairs of particles. So for example, we're also gonna get contaminations from the point, fact that we've got galaxies, one set separated by R1, the other set separated by R2 minus R3, for example we can mostly gloss over that for the purposes of this talk. Of course, we can go further. We can now define the five, six, seven point functions, but this work will mostly restrict to the four point here. But pretty much everything I say does generalize to higher statistics. 
So really the first question I want to answer is how do we compute an endpoint correlation function? And then later on, I'll get into why we actually care. So remembering this definition just had, the endpoint function is an excess probability of finding n galaxies separated by some distances. A naive estimator for how to compute this endpoint function would simply be to take all possible n tuplets of galaxies, for example, triplets, we're interested in the three-point function, and simply place them into bins. So really by hand saying, how many galaxies do we find with this sort of isosceles triangle? Let's just count them all and work it out. So what does this look like? Well, it looks like really just counting all these triplets or tetrahedrons of galaxies on our survey. Now I've only showed here four. In reality, there's a lot more. So we can think about how many possible, say, quadruplets of galaxies we have. The answer really is it's the number of galaxies to the power of four. So it's a huge number. So the computation time for this also scales as this number. So let's say for argument's sake, we have a million galaxies in our survey. The total number of quadruplets is then a million to the four, which is a huge number. And that basically means this sort of method is completely impractical in order to estimate the endpoint functions if n is greater than two. Even for the three-point function, it's just not computationally feasible given the current and future size of data sets. So we need a smarter approach. So that's actually what we've been proposing some of these recent works. And it's all based around the idea that we can write the endpoint function in a very specific basis. So what we want to do is to basically say, we know some information about this. So for example, let's imagine that the endpoint function is isotropic, so it doesn't depend on orientation. And if that's the case, we can expand it into a very particular basis of functions. So we have a general basis of functions which can parameterize any isotropic function, and, then, and their properties are all written down in great detail in this paper by Bob Kahn and Zach Slapin last year. And we simply expand the endpoint function in this basis. So what does this basis actually look like? Well, it's basically just a combination of spherical harmonics. So I'm showing you things for the four-point function here, depends on three lengths. You see this four-point function basis is simply three spherical harmonics, y l1 m1, y l2 m2, y l3 m3, times by some coupling. And noticeably, it's completely separable in r1, r2, and r3, and that's important. Of course, there's some extra sums as well. You don't need to worry too much about the exact form, just to know it exists. And really, this comes about the fact that you can expand the angular dependence of any function in spherical harmonics if you're in 3D. Here, we just find the specific ways of combining those spherical harmonics to give you a function which is globally isotropic. So let's mathematically and more physically what's going on. So we start off with, say, a four-point function, which, as I said, depends on three lengths. We basically explode this tetrahedron then into three separate pieces, the blue line, the red line, and the green line. And as long as we know exactly what these look like for the three vector lengths, R1, R2, and R3, we can reconstruct the tetrahedron itself. Now this is good because these only depend on two galaxies where those guys depended on four. And this is actually the key observation to what makes the algorithm much faster. So practically our endpoint function, rather than being a sum of quartets of galaxies for the four point function, it's now a sum over pairs. So you basically just estimate this blue, this red and this green guy for every single galaxy in our survey. This is what I mean by these ALM guys here. Basically it's just for a pair of galaxies. So what do we have to do physically? We count up these pairs for every possible choice, and then we combine them at the end to get estimates of what the four-point function looks like. And because it's pairs of galaxies, the computation time and the algorithm's complexity formally scales as the number of galaxies squared, which is much better than the number of galaxies to the power n, as I said, for the naive estimator. And of course, this doesn't have to just work for the galaxy surveys. We can in fact extend it to much more general scenarios for example, higher dimensional spaces. So if you want to work in seven dimensions, we can do it. Anisotropic correlation functions, and even curved manifolds. And that's something we've been discussing in this recent paper, which came out last week. Okay, so now let's think a little bit more practically. We have a code which can do exactly this. So this is called the Encore code. It's now public, can be found on GitHub. And this computes the isotropic two through six point correlation functions very efficiently using all the tricks we just talked about plus a lot of code written in C++. And another nice feature about it is it also accounts for the effects of survey geometry on all their endpoint functions. As you're probably familiar, all the galaxy correlation functions are measured with some very anisotropic window function, some set of holes in it. We can actually remove the effects of this window function as it's described in some of the papers. So the code is fully parallelized. It can run on any kind of open MP system. And it also includes GPU support, which is currently being developed, especially by Craig Warner down in Florida. The useful thing about this is that we can compute the correlation functions pretty quickly. So the BOSS four-point function requires about 40 hours to compute. 
in contrast to the three point function, which actually requires about one hour. Turns out that even though all these algorithms technically scale as the number of density squared, the higher point functions take a bit longer to compute, mostly because the number density, mostly because there's more operations going on, the dimension's a bit larger. So to give you an idea of the scaling, this is a plot of the computation time to measure these endpoint functions. So in the red, blue, green, and yellow, I've got three through six point functions. And basically, as you see, as the number density increases, as expected, the computation time goes up. Now, I previously said the computation time would scale as the number of galaxies squared. In fact, what we actually see is an asymptotic scaling more like just linear with the number of galaxies, shown by these dashed lines here rather than the dotted lines. And that's actually because the algorithm contains two steps, one of which is quadratic in the galaxy density, the other which is linear. Turns out the linear piece actually dominates when we have high point functions. So it's even better in fact. So if, for example, with DESI, we have say 10 to 100 times more galaxies. That's gonna mean simply 10 to 100 times more work, which is much better than the quadratic scale. Okay. With that in mind, we now need to answer the other question. Given that we can measure endpoint functions, what can we do with them? So a key part of this is an understanding of the error bars of these endpoint functions. So if I give you some measurement, how to decide, well, is this significant? How much of this is due to noise? So a key point of this is the covariance matrix. And a standard way to compute covariance matrices is simply to compute the statistic on a set of mocks and do a sample covariance. Turns out this is difficult for the, say, four-point functions because it's a very large dimensional statistic. For example, in the four-point function of BOSS we've been measuring, it's 5,000 bins. So we need a heck of a lot of mocks in order to actually get this kind of sample covariance. So a better thing to do is to compute analytic covariance matrices. So this is something that particular John Ho and Bob Khan have been working on down in Florida. Basically, under a certain set of assumptions, in particular, the universe is Gaussian, isotropic, and has a nice geometry, you can compute a theoretical covariance matrix for any of these endpoint functions. So here, this is a small subset of the four-point function matrix. You can see it's got a, got a lot of structure here. I'm showing about the matrix normalized by its diagonal. So it's between one and negative one here. And each of these different pieces basically represents a different angular component of the four-point function. And within each little box, you can see different radial, radial bins. So it's a very complicated matrix. This has been predicted completely by theory. And it turns out the theory is not exactly correct, mostly because we've made a number of simplifying assumptions. But this sort of approach is super useful in terms of getting some compression, which we'll talk about in a minute, and also for sort of forecasting how useful these statistics actually are. And the analysis simply wouldn't be possible if they weren't created. So to compare them to actual observations, I'm now going to show you the results from a thousand simulations. So flipping between the two, we notice that the analytic and sample covariances are actually very similar. So the calculations, which I should say is incredibly complicated and should be out pretty soon, but the calculation works pretty well. Okay, so now we understand the error bars and we can measure the statistic. Let's apply it to data. So this is something we're doing in a paper which will be soon forthcoming, which is to compute the non-Gaussian four-point function from 700,000 galaxies from the BOSS CMAS sample. And it's the first kind of attempt at doing this. We're going to compare this to our null hypothesis that there is zero non-Gaussian four-point function. So any detection we make is going to be a detection of non-Gaussianity, mostly from gravity. So this is what the statistic actually looks like. So you might realize here, four-point functions are very difficult to plot because they contain a lot of information. They've got three sets of angles and three sets of radial bins, even in our isotropic function. But here, I'm basically showing a slice through the function. As you go towards the right, we go on to larger scales. You see, basically, at small scales, we start to have the largest detection of something non-zero. And this is just one of the 42 angular pieces of our four-point function in the basis I mentioned before. So more statistically, can we actually be certain that we've detected something and not just very correlated noise here? So in order to do this, we can basically look at a classical chi-squared test. Um, we will make use of these analytic covariances I mentioned in order to compress down the data. So rather than having 5,000 bins, let's go to 50, but try and keep the signal to noise the same. And that's basically possible for our method back from Roman Scott Chamorro back in the early 2000s. So doing a classical chi-squared test, what we find is the expected chi-squared statistic. I think I used 100 um, bins here in the end. Expected chi-squared statistic looks like this blue line. And what the actual data look like are these yellow and red points here. So in yellow, I'm showing some mocks, and red, the actual BOSS data. And you can see that the data is very much not compatible with our null hypothesis of zero four-point function. So the crucial point here is that we have a strong detection of the non-Gaussian four-point function from current data. And with upcoming data, this is simply going to get stronger. So in the final couple of minutes, I'd like to highlight a couple of useful cosmological things we can actually do with these statistics. So one way to do this is with Fisher forecasts. 
Now, I should say this is very much work in progress. I'm happy to present sort of a couple of initial results from this. So Fisher matrices basically say, what is the information content of my observable? So zeta here would be my endpoint function. We need the derivatives to affect parameters, and we need the covariance. Now, in order to do this, we can either use a theory model or we can use some kind of simulations. Here, we're using the latter, mostly because these observables are very difficult to theorize. Using these Molino simulations from um, Chang Hin Han and Paco Velasco de Navarro from last year, they basically scan over a number of different cosmological parameters, as well as other parameters, including galaxy formation physics, which we get to marginalize over. If we look at the constraints on the right here, I'm showing constraints from the two and the two and three and the two, three and four point functions. And immediately what you see is as we add in this say four point function information, we get a lot more information about cosmological parameters. I would say this is probably over optimistic for a number of reasons, partly including kind of noise in these samples and it's still a work in progress, but I'm hoping to show kind of more final results quite soon. We could of course do the same thing, say adding in Planck information, we get a similar plot. We notice here the constraints are much more dominated by Planck because we're actually using quite low volumes here. This is a one gigaparsec cube simulation, or more strictly about 50,000 of them. But you still see, however, adding in the three and four point functions does tighten the error bars on key cosmological parameters. Finally, I wanna say a couple of words about parity violation. This is kind of a totally different topic, but let's just think for a second in two dimensional space. So in two dimensional space, the action of parity inversion is the same as flipping a statistic in the mirror. Shown for our two point function here, we flip it in the mirror and get this thing on the right. For a two point function, this is equivalent to rotation. For a three point function, we can do the same parity trick, flipping it in the mirror, and we get this thing on the right, but it's not equivalent to rotation anymore within the two dimensions. What does this tell us? Well, it tells us that if we want to look at some signature of parity violation, so say a different number of um, triangles of the left and the right side, then the two-point function is useless because if it's isotropic, we'll automatically get the same number because we can just rotate one into the other. But the three-point function can tell us something interesting. Of course, our universe is actually in three dimensions, not two, it's three spatial dimensions. And for that, it means that both the two and the three-point functions are insensitive to parity. You can just rotate them away. But the four-point function and beyond doesn't satisfy this. So it's really within the four and higher point functions, we can probe if the universe actually is parity breaking. So basically saying, do we get a different number of, say, left-handed and right-handed te tetrapods of galaxies? So we can look at this by technically odd parity four-point function. Under parity, it becomes negative of itself, and it should be zero from all sorts of gravitational evolution. There's a number of ways it could not be zero. These are particularly kind of theoretically exciting. We could have, say, primordial magnetic fields, Chern-Simons terms going on inflation, or the old classic term, systematics. However, the standard kind of say perturbation theory approaches will never predict an odd parity four point function at any order, simply because gravity conserves parity by definition. So what does this look like? I'd love to say I have some results. Sadly, these are still very much blinded. Um, the analysis is not yet complete, but will be done so hopefully in the next month or two. What I'm showing you here on the right is this null hypothesis that we don't have a parity violating four point function. And the yellow is the mocks, which also do not have any parity violation. And at some point, we're going to have a boss data set somewhere superimposed on this. So obviously, it'd be great if we made a strong detection of parity violation. As yet, we'll see. Probably we won't, but who knows? So stay tuned for that. So at this point, I'd like to wrap up and say, firstly, again, thank you very much for coming. And my real conclusion here is that due to some new advancements in estimators, we can now estimate endpoint functions very quickly, including three, four, five, and six point functions. They can be measured from data and measured from data at pretty high significance. And in fact, if we include these in our cosmological analyses, we can get tighter constraints on cosmological parameters, as well as make interesting tests, say, of parity violating physics, which we can only probe with these sorts of higher statistics. So again, thank you very much. And if anyone has any questions, I'd be very happy to hear them. So I've listed my email address and also Twitter here. So please get in touch if you have questions. Thanks.